Morning. So today we're going to be answering questions and no questions too silly. It's uh, a time where if you've got a question about beekeeping and you're keen to get started, you can ask whatever you like and I'll answer them. And Bianca here, who's, who's one of our amazing customer support people, will be reading those questions out so we can answer them while we're on the call. So if you've got questions in the comments below, also let us know what you'd like to see or an example of what you'd like us to um, show in, uh, in another Facebook live stream. So any questions in the comments below. Meanwhile, we will harvest a little bit of honey and I'll just explain a little bit about how that works. So if you look at this hive here, you can tell quite a bit without opening it. And that was part of my father and I's invention was to, to really um, design it. So you could tell as much as you can from the outside without having to open it. Now you can see in the, um, in the side window here, you can see that um, the bees have been consuming a little bit of honey by this spotty pattern. You can see capped honey here, and you can see them eating it here. So we're not gonna harvest a lot of honey today because we know the bees are in a hungry time and not in a, in a time where they're depositing nectar. And so there's not an abundance of flowers around at the moment. But you can see in this window here, there's a bit of a, a story you can tell from looking at the, the frames here. And that, that was another part of our invention was to, to make it so you could actually watch the bees deposit nectar in the cells with their tongues. Here's a frame that we've harvested recently. You can see it's all empty. But if you go to this frame here, it's mostly full. And this frame's nice and full. And you can see they're capping down the edge here. So when they've filled all the cells and put their capping on, that means the bees have dewatered the nectar to the point where it's below 20% and the honey will then keep on the shelf. So that's what you're looking for before you harvest is capped honey. Now, using the side windows and the end window, you can get a fair idea. When they're in this eating phase, sometimes they do eat a little bit of honey out from the center of the frame, which just means you don't get as much when you harvest. So the way you do this is you take out this little cap from the top, and if you come down to the bottom here, there's also another one in the bottom. So you take that out. Then you've got this little tube here where there's a kind of a tongue and that goes into the bottom point here. Now, there's a specific reason for that and that's to clear out any wax the bees might have put in this point here. So any remaining honey when you're finished can just drain back into the hive for the bees to reuse. So that goes in there. Then you've got a key which resembles like a large Allen key really and you put it in to the top of the frame here and give it a turn. Now what's happening is inside the frame, the parts are moving like this and making a pathway for honey to flow down into the trough at the bottom and out of the hive. So if we watch, we'll start to see that happening right here in this frame. Now, if you wanted to harvest just a small amount, you can put the key in just a little way like that. If you want to harvest some more, you can put it in, in further and keep opening that frame. So I'm going to go all the way with this frame like that. And you're just moving it to that 90 position. Sometimes it can be quite firm with the wax and propolis joining all of those moving parts inside the frame together. For those that are just tuning in, we're answering beginner beekeeping questions. If you've got a question about beekeeping, no matter what it is, put it in the comments below and we'll answer them. The idea is that um, it's a time where you can ask me anything and I'll answer a way to um, help you get started in beekeeping in this fascinating world. Danny would like to know, what is the average lifespan of a queen? Okay, so the queen bee is pretty special and it's quite amazing that the queen bee and a worker bee start off as, as the same as an egg and they hatch and, they, and then they're 
they're just a tiny little larva in the bottom of the cell. Now, the first three days of their life, they're both fed royal jelly, a worker and a queen. But the queen, if they want to turn that, uh, that baby larva into a queen, they'll continue to feed it royal jelly. And what happens is the genetics then are set for, for it to, to supersize, to grow big ovaries, to grow bigger legs. And it can then live for up to about six years of laying a couple of thousand eggs a day compared to a worker bee, which might only live for, for, for four weeks or so when it's foraging in the, in the summertime. So isn't that amazing? You're looking at four weeks versus six years just by the genetic changes and the jobs they're doing in the hive. Andrea asks roughly how much honey do you get from a full frame? So a full frame is about three kilograms of honey so that's a big tall jar like this or, or all of these jars here you can see on the roof. Now interestingly enough we've got, um, we've got honey here. I'm just going to taste it because I, um, I can't help myself. Um, and see, see what this honey is. Okay, I'm not tasting one specific thing. I'm not tasting the melaleuca or the iron bark or, um, or something I know distinctive. It's more of a, a mix, this frame. But you're also getting globules showing a, um, the uh, medicinal properties of the leptospermin flowers here or the Australian manuka, which is which is cool. So it's, it's quite a mixture of, of a few different things coming out of this frame right here. So we asked, do you need a permit in Queensland to keep the bees in a flow hive? So what you need is to register. So the DPI has, has a lot of resources, it has free, um, free setups where you can send a sample of your hive if your hive's got a problem and they'll test it for, for things like AFB or EFB. So um, there's a, it, it's a very supportive organisation and you need to register your hive to say um, I'm keeping one hive, two hives, five hives and um, you can do that just by going to the DPI website. And um, that's your, your, and then of course there's, there's information and obligations that come along with beekeeping and you'll find out all about that from the DPI. We haven't got any more questions coming in yet, but I have one. What type of bees work in a flow hive and where do we get bees from? Okay, so the bees in this hive are um, the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. Now that's the one that humans have dragged all around the world with them because of their amazing ability to pollinate and, and store an amazing amount of honey. So the this is the, uh, the same bees you'll see all over the world doing their amazing job. A hive like this can pollinate 50 million flowers a day, which is just unbelievable. And um, however, there are, there are um, variants in, in Japan. We have um, the, the um, Apis serrana, which is, a, it's also called the Asian honeybee, and that also works in a flow hive. However, we've modified the size of the frame to suit them because they are a smaller bee that like a, a smaller hive. There's also the Cape honeybee in South Africa that also works with the flow hive, which is another, another variation again. Um, and then as far as colony forming bees, there are other colony forming bees, like in Australia we have uh, a, a native bee which is very small like it looks like a tiny little black fly that won't work in this type of hive and they also don't store a whole lot of honey so you probably wouldn't invent a system to harvest honey from them. Chris says how often does it take for one frame to fill with honey? So one frame can fill with honey quite quickly if you've got a strong colony and you've got a good nectar flow so so um, one of our team here in the office set up their, their hive last year and it was, it was a fresh um, 
install the the frames went on a couple of weeks they filled up the whole box and he went wow and harvested it all a week later they filled it up again and then he harvested it all but that's an extreme example of how fast it can happen and how exciting it can be at times but you also get times when when uh, the five months might go by with nothing so it like any kind of agriculture it's quite seasonal it's weather dependent and you find areas of, of Australia that have been in drought for a long time and what you um, find is um, if, if the weather's not right the flowers don't bloom and you don't get a um, honey crop so so yeah it really does depend if you have a strong colony lots of bees then it gets quite exciting and, and lots of lots of flowers at the time Peter Cox, is one of, who is one of our great flow ambassadors in South Australia, asks, is it a good idea to inspect a hive when it is cold and wet, and how will this affect bees? Hi, Peter. Um, so we often show inspecting here, um, even in the winter time. However, if you were further south and it was cold, as the southern parts of Australia can get quite cold, then you wouldn't be opening your hive in that time. The brood can be quite sensitive, um, to temperature so if you, if you do have to open your hive and it is cold then you want to make sure you don't open it for too long. So here we've, um, we're in the subtropics you do get quite warm days in winter and we do still open hives in the winter time. The best time is a warm sunny day mid morning to mid afternoon to do your brood inspection. So what Peter's talking about there is from time to time you need to take apart your hive, get in your bee suit, get your smoker out, take a look at what's going on in the brood nest. And it's called a, a brood inspection and we show you live, if, if you want to look up brood inspection on our Facebook videos or our YouTube, plenty of examples of what you do there and, and um, what's expected in the brood nest. It's uh, a fascinating world to peep into and see what's happening in your hive. Steve would like to know, do any plastic components of the hive have an effect on the taste of the honey? Okay, the answer is no. The bees cover all the components in wax and they, they all get quite waxy after a while and so your honey is still encapsulated in wax. Now, um, plastic's not new to beekeeping at all. There's, um, for the last 30 years, many commercial um, apiaries use plastic um, foundation and some use fully drawn plastic um, cells to store their honey in. So what we've done is come along and made um, the, the uh, partly drawn cells for the bees to complete and then cover all in wax and fill with nectar, finally cap off and then those parts move inside. So our big innovation was to have moving parts in the frame that allow you, you to tap off the honey directly from the hive. Danny would like to know, when dealing with burr comb, I've heard that you can throw it on the ground and some say this isn't the best idea or practice. What is your um, best idea for dealing with burr comb? Okay, really good point. Now, what happens if you throw comb that's got honey in it onto the ground is bees from your hives will go and get that honey and that gets them a taste for honey instead of flowers and, and the nectar from flowers. And then they start looking for honey and you get what's called robbing where, where that hive will then look for honey in, in another hive and they can rob out a, a, a weak hive completely, which will be the end of that colony. And that also will share pathogens around. So let's say if you've got a, a weak hive and it's weak because it's got um, a, a pathogens in there like AFB or EFB, then that will then share to the hives that are, are robbing it. So you really don't want to promote robbing and that's why you should never leave honey out in the open. And, and uh, in some states it's actually illegal to leave um, honey out in the open. So do be mindful when you're working your hive not to leave any, any honey out, any burr comb out because um, that will we'll, uh, start that robbing process. Now, what you can do is you can, you can take it inside, you can chew on it, you, can, um, you could uh, bury it, 
um, but just don't don't leave it out. Now we've got exposed honey here, which often people question, but it's not exposed long enough for the bees to find it, go and, and tell tell the colony that there's honey at the back here, and 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 uh, that robbing process would then start. However, if you've got robbing happening in your apiary anyway, or the bees are really hungry, you sometimes can get them coming for this honey, in which case you need to cover it because you don't want them eating honey outside the hive. Maureen asks, does the frame need to be full to harvest? So the frame doesn't need to be full to harvest, but it's better if the frame is full to harvest. The reason being is you want the honey to be at a low moisture content. If the moisture content is above 20%, then it won't keep on the shelf. It'll start to ferment and turn into mead. If you've accidentally harvested honey too early and it is quite liquid in the jar, then consume it before it starts fermenting or make mead out of it. Damien asks, do any bees die during harvest? So we, we put a lot of effort and 10 years of, of development making sure that the frame parts would, wouldn't harm bees. And the, the way we did that was make sure the space in between the moving parts. So if, if, if you imagine a cell like this, if, if you just had it bang up against each other, then um, the parts would move like that and a bee could put parts of its body through there and it can move back and catch legs and wings and things. So what we did is then put space in between like that and the bees would then wax up and form bridges across between the parts so that if bees are down the cells, let's say you've harvested in a time when there's, the, there's a big empty patch in the comb, there happens to be bees down cells and you um, move the parts, then, then um, you put them back again then, then there's this gap here, so the bees don't get their legs and, and wings caught. So, so um, certainly there's, um, we, we achieved our goal and that was to harvest in a very gentle way. If you look in here, you'll see that the bees have hardly even noticed that there's any change in the hive at all. Whereas if you were pulling it apart to harvest, like the conventional way, then you would certainly notice that um, you were rolling and squashing bees like I used to do a lot of. And it was part of the inspiration of making the flow hive was, hang on a second, how do we make it so the honey can just be tapped out while the bees are going about doing their thing and there's minimal disturbance to your hive. And there's a whole lot of benefits that come with minimal disturbance. Carl asks, do you normally have just one brood box below? So good question. I do prefer just to keep one brood box, keeps things simple. In our climate it works very nicely. If you go to some colder parts, if you're here in, in the, the southern parts of Australia or the northern parts of America, then you may find that beekeepers will often keep a double brood box or a brood box and then a um, half size second brood box. and what that um, does is allow a bit of extra room for the bees to, to lay and store also honey in that area as well. And that can be an advantage if you're, if you're, getting, you're wanting to get your hive through the winter time. Also can be a, an advantage if you've got a short, sharp honey flow where you need quite a big colony to take advantage of it. So in Canada, they, they, they do like to have um, a double brood most of the time because they want to get a big colony started in spring to take advantage of just a, a, a maybe six weeks of honey flow for the whole year. So you need, need a really, really big population to really take advantage of that. So you, if you're in one of those colder parts then you might want to order a second brood box. When you're starting out I'd still recommend start with this configuration as they've started to fill this with honey, then you can add the second brood box in between. And that way you'll get faster activity on your flow frames. Adrian says that he, they are gaining lots of population, but he's wondering if he should add another brood box or super. Okay, so if you've got a lot of bees 
in your hive, then there's a few options. So if you do nothing, then come springtime, the, uh, the hive will probably swarm. So that's the natural progression is that numbers build up, they divide and swarm. Now if you're not around to catch that swarm, you'll lose half your bees. And if you're in a, in a um, urban environment, then um, it, it might go over your fence and bother your neighbors. Um, so if, you're, if you do have a lot of bees when you open the side window, then you may want to take what's called a split. So in, in the springtime, in the early spring, or when, whenever they're, they're building up a lot, you can take the, uh, the top box off and then take some of the brood frames out and put them into another box. And that's just explaining it very simply, but we have videos showing you exactly how to do that if you want to take a split. And um, the great thing is you end up with another colony. It's great to have a number of colonies because one will do great, one will do really poorly, another one will do okay. And, and it, it's, it's also handy if you've got a failing colony and you actually want to prop it up and um, if they don't have the resources to make another queen, for instance, you could get a frame from one hive, move it to another. Always better to have <coughs> multiple hives and, and start your little apiary. Erin says, my bill, bees have filled the brood box with comb but will not go into the super. What can I do? Okay. So um, the time to super, as you say, is when the brood box is filled with comb. Now, the term super it is a honey box. So we call this a flow super because it's a, a honey box with flow frames in it. So the time to add your flow super is when this box is, is full with bees and has finished building out all of your frames with, with comb and so on. So um, if, um, if you've added it and, and you open the side window and you're not seeing many bees in there, then the population probably needs to expand a little bit to get a lot of activity on your flow frame. So you're waiting for the honey flow to come in, you're waiting for the population to pick up a bit in order for them to really um, start that process of storing honey on the flow frames. However, if you want to speed things up a little bit, you can get your hive tool, scrape off some burr comb from on top of the frames in your brood box and simply just press it into the flow frame surface. You won't damage it, just press it in and the bees will go, hang on a minute, what's that waxy clump of uh, burr comb doing in the middle of a frame pattern and they will quickly recycle that wax and start working on the comb. So you might want to do it right on the observation window and you can enjoy watching them grab that, that um, wax and recycle it and start the process of, of waxing up the flow frames. So that can be a good trick if you're getting impatient and you want some more activity on your flow frames. Let me know how you go. Tina from Bundaberg, Queensland asks, should I have my hive in full sun? Okay, bees are amazing at air conditioning their hive. They can, they can be in hot, they can be in cold, they can be in shade, they can be in sun. However, if you have a choice, then the best thing to do is have, have um, a little bit of sun in the morning to, to, to wake them up, get them going, get them foraging. and um, in the summertime, some shade. So in the Southern Hemisphere here, if we put our hives on the north side of, of a row of trees, for instance, then um, you get that beautiful setup where the, you get some winter sun in the colder times and summer shade during those hot days. So that's the ideal if you can get it. Here, as you can see, we've just got them all out in the open and they're still fine. They, they do, um, get quite warm but we've got the screen bottom boards to, to ventilate them and help them cool their hive in the summertime and the bees will go and collect water, take it into the hive, fan it and use evaporative cooling to actually air condition the hive which is incredible. They work together as such, a, such an amazing um, colony to, to do all the things they need to do to raise, raise a couple of thousand new bees every day. Andrea would like to know how often should you inspect the hive? 
So inspecting your hive um, does vary from where you are in, in the world. So here we don't have the varroa mites, so we don't need to go through varroa treatments, which is often um, a need for a lot more frequent inspections during the um, honey season. Here you do have commercial beekeepers who routinely go through their brood nest start to finish a couple of times a year and just check for things like AFB and EFB and so on. And also as needed, if you notice the numbers in a hive dropping, or you notice this hive's not storing any honey, but the next hive is, you wanna get in there and check out what's going on. Also observing things like, um, you know, what's happening in the tray at the bottom, the entrance and so on, and using observations to tell you when you need to get in there and have a look. The other time is spring management in the springtime. If you want to take a split or if you want to um, just open up the brood nest and, and limit swarming, there's a few things you can do there by adding some, um, some starter frames in your brood nest so they've got a brand new area to lay in the springtime. So there's a whole lot of reasons for inspecting. The best advice will be from your local beekeepers as to what you may encounter in your area and how, how often you might need to inspect your brood nest. Tony asks, when is the best time to do a split around Coffs Harbour area in the coming weeks? So it'd be a little, little um, too soon to split now, but the, the answer is have a look at your bees when they're really packed in the hive then that is the time that um, you'll, you'll, you'll need to be taking a split or, or taking some action. So I would predict Coffs Harbour area you'll probably be doing your splits in September. Great. Uh, Chris asks any advice on keeping ants out of the hive? Okay ants can be a bit of a nuisance they don't harm your colony but they're they're just annoying to have around. If you've left these caps off, then they'll get right in there and um, make a mess. Um, so it's important to leave those caps on. But what you'll find is they might get in behind these window covers and, and make a bit of a mess. Now it's usually, usually in the times when it's just been raining and they come up out of the ground looking for drier homes. And what you can do to um, deter them, if you've got our, if you've got our um, flow hive too, there's these, um, there's these legs that you can actually add some grease to. So I would recommend something like Vaseline or white grease, so it's not so grubby when you when you touch it, and you can put it around that uh, leg just on the metal section, and that will um, be an ant barrier, so hard for the ants to come up. Of course, if you if you're making an ant barrier. Um, then you'll need to keep the foliage away from your hive or the ants will just walk up the foliage and onto your hive. Some people use um, water cups with the, with the feet of the hive or some kind of hive stand resting in cups of water. A little bit more maintenance, making sure the water level stays, um, stays up. So grease could be uh, an easier solution. Catherine asks, do you need a suit up to harvest the honey? So generally you don't need to suit up to harvest the honey. However, if you're new to beekeeping, wear your bee suit, get comfortable with your hive, get to know your bees. Some hives can be aggressive and, and until you know your hives, then wear your suit and, and protect yourself. And also um, make sure you think about um, other people. We do um, have first aid information on, on our website. Have a look at that make sure you know um, your first aid when it comes to, to bee stings. There is um, some people that can have really serious allergic reactions to stings and um, that's really important to know about. Diana would like to know, do you have to place the hive away from places where there are homes or people around? Okay, we do have a whole um, video if you, if you type in situating your hive into our YouTube channel that covers a bunch of points that you should think about. But basically the flight path of a hive is out the front and generally up and away unless there's some kind of barrier that makes them do a U-turn. So um, 
when you're situating your hive, you don't want that flight path to be where people often are walking, or they might get accidental stings or fly into the hair. Um, if you're pointing it um, uh, towards your neighbours, that might not be so good either. So you just need to consider that. But also another thing is if the hive entrance can see a, um, a light on the outside of your house, like a porch light or something, then you might get some bees at night buzzing around that porch light, which can be a, a bit of a nuisance. So think about that as well. And then you've got the, the factors of um, the sun and shade and trying to, to um, get the, the best outcome there. So have a look at that video when choosing where to put your hive. Mark would, li would like to know, should you keep the bottom white ventilation board clean or leave some of the pollen that falls on there? Um, so so uh, talking about the flow hive too, if you have a look here, if you have a look in this um, tray at the bottom, you'll notice that some debris will collect in that area. So that's pretty normal. It's just bits of pollen and things and debris from the hive, bits of wax that the bees have, have dropped falling through that screen bottom board. So from time to time, you can clean that out. And it depends a bit on what you're doing. If you're using it to catch beetles, give it a good clean, put some, some cooking oil in there just to cover the surfaces. If you're using it for mites, then you'll need to keep it clean to count them. You can actually turn the tray upside down. If you're finding it's collecting water, you've got driving rain coming in the entrance, then um, you'll need to, uh, you could just turn the tray upside down and then water won't pull in your tray. Okay. Some great questions coming in. For those that are just tuning in, we're just answering beginner beekeeping questions. So there's no such thing as a silly question. Put them in the comments below and we'll answer them. And uh, hopefully that will, um, will help you get started in the amazing world of beekeeping. Bare Knuckle McKee asks, how do you inspect your hives? So to inspect the hive, you'll need to get in your bee suit, get your smoker, add some smoke to the entrance, allow a little time for your, your bees to calm, choose a nice warm sunny day, and then you lift the top box off and that gives you access to the brood box and inside the brood box is conventional frames, so wood, with uh, the bees building their comb inside those frames. Now, what you need to do then is lift those frames out. We've got lots of videos showing you how to do that, lots of live streams of inspecting your brood nest. So if you type in brood inspection into our YouTube channel, you'll see just how to do that. And it's a fascinating thing to lift the um, frames out and just see what's going on in your hive. And you learn something new every time. If you don't, you're not looking hard enough. It's a, a totally fascinating world and we are so lucky to be able to, to um, be able to look in on that and, and see this intricate and interwoven nature of bees and all of the things they do in a hive. Diana would like to know, where do you buy non-aggressive bees? So Bee, uh, bee breeders will breed for non-aggressive traits. It is annoying if you've got an aggressive hive, so they will breed from bees that have um, non-aggressive traits. And uh, so if you order a queen from them or a nucleus, like, which is just basically a small starter hive, then they, they will have bred for non-aggressive um, bees. So that's the best way to go if you really want a nice, calm hive. If you go and catch a swarm or take a split and let the bees raise their own queen, then it's a bit of luck of the draw. When the queen does her mating flight, they could have mated with uh, drones from you know, some wild aggressive hive and then those genetics will then become part of your hive. Now some people don't mind having an aggressive hive but it depends on your situation and depends if, if you've got um, your children around and if, if you're, you're in an area where there's lots of people around then it's a good idea to, to order nice calm bees. I might just swap that jar. Danny would like to know what type of feeders do you find work best? 
So we don't have to do a whole lot of feeding in this area because um, the, there's always something flowering in the times in between when there's not a whole lot aren't that uh, long. However, some areas have um, issues where they might not have had a good nectar flow and people will tend to, to feed them um, sugar or sugar syrup prior to the winter to make sure they have enough stores to last. Now, under the um, lid of the hive, you will notice there there is a, um, a plug. You can pull that plug out and make a really simple feeder just by drilling some holes in the lid of a jar, fill it full of um, sugar syrup, turn that upside down and it'll create an airlock and the bees will suck the nectar out of those little holes in the jar. You can also get some purpose-built feeders to go under the roof of your flow hive. There's a round one you'll see um, that goes can go under the lid and that type of feeder you can then refill the syrup without actually having to um, access the, the bees. So that could be a good one to use. Um, it just fits under the lid, the lid or depending on which bottle you have, sit up just a little bit. If you want to do a big jar feeder or a big feeder under the lid, then you can use a spare box to then raise the lid up to this height and give you plenty of room to, to make a feeder. There was um, a video, if you, if you type in Flow Hive and Feeding Bees on our, on our Facebook page, you'll find one about different types of feeders that um, you can make at home and put under the lid. There's very simple ones you can make and um, that will then prop up your bees in times when there's no nectar. Laura asks, can you run through a checklist of things to do on day one when I receive my new bees? Okay, so um, you've, you've, uh, you've got your hive, make sure you've put it together, make sure you've, you've chosen a location, have a look at our situating your hive video because you don't want to go on putting your bees there than having to move it because th there's, there's factors that bees geo locate to that spot. So choose your spot first, make sure your hive's together. If you're going to add a stain to your hive, make sure you've done that or, or painted your hive. Then your bees arrive on your doorstep or you've gone and picked them up from a bee breeder and you've got this, let's say you've started with a, with a, um, a nucleus. So you've got this nucleus of bees and then what you're going to need to do is put them um, beside your hive and get in your bee suit. So you need to make sure you've, you've got a bee suit. You need to make sure you've got a smoker and you'll also need a hive tool. So our bee suits come with the, um, the J hive tool, which is useful for, for opening boxes apart, scraping wax and lifting frames out. Then you'll need to open up your nucleus box and we've got videos showing you how to do this and transfer those frames in to your brood box. Now you won't need the super for a little while if you're just starting. So if you're a little bit time short, you could just assemble the bottom box, the base and the, the uh, roof and um, the super. You won't need till a little bit later after the bees have, have bred up and filled your um, brood box. So um, yeah, best of luck with installing your bees, that's really exciting. Uh, let us know how you go. Kane asks, would the flow hive be able to work if the bees pollinate native jelly bush? I've heard the honey is thick and might not be able to. Okay, so we've actually got a bit of jelly bush in the honey today and um, we noticed that earlier by the little globules coming out and you probably see it a little bit in the stream now because the stream's not flowing just in, in a straight stream there's like these little um, jelly bits coming out and that's the jelly bush so um, what happens is if you've got a mixture in the frame which most of the time you do unless you're, you're a, a, a uh, jelly bush enthusiast and trying to get 100% jelly bush by going to only where the flowers are and emptying out all your frames just prior. It's actually pretty hard to get 100% but if you do 
you might find that it, um, that it won't come out of the frames. But if it's a mix, then it will. So um, the the so it's called Dixotropic honey when you've got um, a honey that sets like jelly, and it's quite hard to extract extract in any kind of fashion. And um, so uh, so yeah, that that could happen, but um, it's pretty rare here when we really don't get 100% jelly bush in our frames. There are people that do go and seek that. Um, there are lots of other medicinal species, 185 different leptospermums here, and most of them aren't, um, don't have that thixotropic jelly property. So if you were planning to, to plant a farm of medicinal Australian manuka, and you wanted to use the flow hives, you might choose to mix it up and have a whole lot of species that didn't have the jelly property. Clay asks, what determines the dark colour or light colour of honey? So the dark colour or light colour is determined by the nectar. Some flowers will produce really light, almost up to clear honey. And then you've got all of these beautiful tones in between. So these um, these darker tones are coming from the um, the, uh, the coastal heathland here, where we do have the leptospermums, we do have um, banksias, and we do have a whole lot of things that have those darker, rich tones. Once we've harvested this, I would bet that it's going to fill up with a lighter coloured honey. Now, that'll happen because the iron barks are starting to flower, which is a light gold yellow colour. So it, the beautiful thing is, you get this effect where in your, in your window you get all of these different colours of honey and different flavours and get to taste all these different flavours of your season in the one hive. It's such a, um, such a beautiful thing and an unexpected thing was the flow hive with the flow hive was the benefit of being able to harvest single frame honeys and in doing so end up with such a variety of flavours to share with your friends and family. It's one of my favourite things is to taste all the different flavours of honey from your hive. Jason would like to know I, if I have partially filled frames at the end of the season but they aren't fully capped, what should I do with that not quite cured honey? Okay, so if you're in a colder climate and you want to um, take the box off, which is what you're referring to. So there's a few things you could do. One is you could remove the excluder and let the bees consume that honey. Another thing is you could decide to um, feed them to, to um, complete the process of them capping it off. And, and um, you might remove the excluder for winter so the queen doesn't get off and blow it if the, if the um, bees are moving up to consume that honey. Now, if you've got a um, situation where you want to just take the box off and store it, but there's honey that isn't capped, then you'll need to keep that in a very cold place, like a freezer, or perhaps the temperatures in your area might be cold enough. And that way, the honey won't ferment and you can put it back on in the springtime and the bees can continue. Okay, we've got time for a, um, a couple more questions. Thank you so much for, for all your great questions. If you've got more, you can just keep putting them in the comments below and we'll answer them in written form. Andrew asks, do the hives work well in suburban areas with lots of gardens? So the answer is yes. We, there's a real growing trend of city beekeeping. It's, it's so interesting, but in the city you get people planting all sorts of flowers in their gardens, so the bees have a real variety and often a longer season than you have out in the natural landscapes. So, and people also appreciate all the flavours that come in from all of the flowers that people plant and, and often city beekeepers pride themselves in having all of these beautiful flavours that people out in the countryside don't get. So. Um, you certainly can um, keep bees in, in suburban areas, in, in city areas. My sister's keeping bees on her balcony in Berlin right now and harvesting honey 
at the moment, which is beautiful to see. So um, there's other people that even put their hive inside with them and have a pipe from the hive going outside. So, and then they, they look in on their bees and it becomes quite a, an observation piece for people who visit to, to really look in and see how their bees are going. Jason says a big fan of the flow hive, but there remains some stubborn resistance by traditional beaks who erroneously think that the ease of honey equates to not real beekeeping. Can you reinforce the reality that actual beekeeping is totally the same and that new beekeepers should seek out classes and local experienced beekeepers to learn from? Great Jason, yes of course. So in the bottom box here you've got a conventional beehive. The bees are the same as they always have been and still need the same care they always have had. So if you look after the bees, then they'll look after us, and the honey really is an amazing bonus. Now, bees, like any form of agriculture, come with obligations, so it, the, it is mandatory to keep your hive in such a way that you can inspect your colony, and you do need to inspect routinely for disease, for pests, and make sure you are doing the, um, the right thing and looking after your brood nest here. And if you look after the bees, then that's when you get the reward of a healthy colony. So yes, you do need to, when you order your hive, you do need to order your smoker, you do need to order your bee suit, and um, that's really important. So that was a common criticism that came really early on because when we originally launched our crowdfunding video, we didn't for one know that it was going to go totally nuts and, and, and get so much interest. We thought we were, we were um, pitching to existing beekeepers that of course know how to look after bees. Now, what happened was we inspired a whole new wave of beekeepers, which is fantastic because in the, in the US, for instance, there was, uh, was 200,000 beekeepers 40 years ago. And what happened was those numbers dropped to 100,000. So beekeepers had halved in, in uh, a period of, of 40 years. And of course we need another generation of beekeepers coming through to make sure we have enough honeybees in the world to um, sustain our uh, needs for pollination and so on. So um, we're really proud that we've inspired a lot of beekeepers and what we've done is continue to develop information for beekeepers to get started, to continue to um, educate beekeepers and what we're finding is the exact opposite of the fears that were originally put forward is that there's so many new beekeepers getting totally fascinated with their hives, riding in whenever they see any kind of um, thing happening in their hive, people getting really um, really passionate about beekeeping and I think that is fantastic. Of course, like any kind of hive and like any kind of pursuit, you are going to get some people who get started and then decide that it's not for them. So, um, so while we can't stop that altogether, we do put a lot of effort into, into making educational material and making sure um, all of our customers have the resources they need in order to, to get started looking after bees and doing all of the things they need to do to keep hives happy and healthy. And um, it's uh, just so great to see that process unfolding. Ron now would like to know, why does honey crystallise? So depending on the ratios of the different types of sugars in the honey, well, will determine whether the honey crystallises and how soon. All honey almost will crystallise eventually. So you get some, like the, the paper bark honey here, will actually crystallise sometimes in the frames, um, especially if you've taken the frames off the hive and let them get really cold. Now, um, it, usually it'll just partly crystallise and it'll still flow out, but you'll see kind of this cloudy nature in your jar. But as soon as you've harvested it, sometimes it'll come out perfectly clear, you put it on the shelf, and the next day it's already going candied, and a week later it's solid in the jar. So that's just the, um, the nature of sugar crystals and the way they form depending on the ratios 
of sugars and it's a perfectly natural thing and it's quite a nice thing to have some different candied honeys on the shelf, different textures, different flavours and people will often purposefully get the honey to candy by adding some nice fine crystals from another honey to their to their um, recently harvested honey and then watch as it takes on that same crystalline structure and forms a, a beautiful candy that can be in, enjoyed. Okay, one more question. Shay asks, in cold climates, how do you winterize and what do you do with the bees? So, there's a few things to do to prepare your hive for winter if you're in a cold climate. Here, we don't need to do anything because it's a subtropical region and our winter is still quite warm and bees will forage and actually bring in honey in the winter time. In the, the southern parts of Australia here or in the uh, northern parts of America where it's colder or in Europe, then preparing your hive for winter, it, there's a few factors but the main one is to make sure they have enough stores to last the winter and you'll find that information out from your local beekeepers. The, um, the next one is to make sure if you've left your flow hive super on, there's different schools of thought. Some people will take it off for the winter, put it back on in spring. Other people will leave it on, but you will need to take the excluder out, which is the, is the queen excluder between these two boxes, which is a grid that doesn't allow the queen to pass through. Reason being is as the ball of bees are huddling together in that cold winter time, and that they move up to consume honey in this top box. You don't want her left behind below the excluder in the cold or she could perish and then come spring, you won't have a queen. So there's a few things to consider, but asking your local beekeepers is a great idea at, to find out what you need to do in your area. Thanks so much for, for tuning in and, um, and asking all the great questions about getting started and best of luck with your beekeeping journey. It's such a fascinating and rewarding thing, not only for, for helping pollination, but also the beautiful honey you get and the educational experience if you've got a family by watching the bees and watching them actually collect that nectar from the surrounding, sometimes up to 10 kilometers and bring that all back into your hive and turn it into this beautiful thing we call honey.